Father, you are so wonderful. Jesus, we acknowledge your presence in this place. You promised when two or three gather, you are in the midst of them. And we experience your presence. The presence of the Holy Spirit that's so sweet. And Lord, we just want to bless you and worship you. Thank you, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for all of your grace. For all of your mercy. For all that you've done. For all that you are doing. Thank you, Lord, for guidance. Thank you, Lord, that you deliver us daily. That you protect us. That you provide in all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We bless you for that. Hallelujah. You may take your seats. God is good. I know this is supposed to be the Afrikaans service. But I felt like this morning uh, to just continue tonight. And um, from next week on we will have uh, the Afrikaans service again in the evening. And I would encourage you to come to both. You know. Come to both so that you can preach in Afrikaans and English. So, so you can pray in Afrikaans and English. Okay? Um, God is good. For those of you who don't know, uh, we are busy talking about uh, the dangers of pride. God has taken us on a trip and uh, uh, told us to do certain things. We started off by just reading the word, then we start off by praying. And God eventually said this year is the year of making disciples and reaching out. And as soon as we started doing that, God started to touch our own family members. And they were coming in. Yes. And then uh, we were praying uh, specifically for revival and for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And during the past month or months now, uh, we have seen how uh, God delivered people in the church. And uh, all kinds of demons came out. And uh, people are lighter. You will even feel the atmosphere is lighter. And uh, I am convinced in my heart that uh, when that is done, sort of, we will see great miracles of healing. We trust in God for that. God showed me in a dream that He's going to impart the gift of faith. God's faith. And uh, we're going to see tremendous things. But before I get into the message, I want Natalie to just testify. Because, you know, when she told me that this afternoon, I realized, come. I realized that there's a corporate anointing for this uh, that we are busy doing. And uh, just tell us the whole story. Now you know what some of us do between, in between services. This afternoon my niece came and she visited me and um, she started talking and telling me that she has severe heart pul palpitations during the night and, and anxiety. And she's been to multiple people for deliverance and they cannot help her. And she was saying that she wants to stop smoking. But she smokes half a cigarette, so the whole house is full of, of cigarettes, but she just cannot do it. So her whole family was there, and I said, can I pray for you? And she said, yes, please do. So I did, I told her to sit down, and I started praying for her, and um, by the grace of God, the demons started manifesting. And as I prayed for her, she slipped off the chair, and she laid on the floor. And um, I think the Holy Spirit was dealing with it. In. And one of our little girls bounced over and she said, What's mommy doing on the floor? And I said, oh, Jesus is just helping her. So she bounced off again. But when my niece got up, I asked her, Hi, How are you feeling? And she said, I'm on fire. <laughs> so I'm going to God. Praise the Lord. That's what we should be doing. We should take what we receive here and go and give it out to people uh, in our families. And uh, there is now a tremendous anointing for the deliverance of people. And so go and take it. Uh, don't be afraid to pray for people who are demonized. Cast them out. The Lord says, for those who believe, these signs shall follow. Number one, in my name they shall cast out devils. Number two, in, uh, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And uh, so, so we should not be holding back. It's for each and every one of us to preach the gospel with the demonstration of power. Amen. Now, we've, uh, we, uh, God has laid in my heart to talk about uh, uh, pride and humility. Pride versus humility. Uh, it's a spiritual law. Because we, we were praying that God would remove certain obstacles that keep us from experiencing God's best. 
Now, there's several things that God has done in our lives, like, like uh, I've shared, but there is one thing that can keep you from the best that God has for you, and that is pride. Uh, God absolutely hates pride. We've seen this morning that pride was first committed, not by a man, but by an angel called Lucifer. And uh, because of that pride, he fell. And this is a spiritual law that says that if you exalt yourself, uh, you will be brought low. You will be humbled. If you humble yourself, then at the right time, God will exalt you. And I want us to read that scripture again in Matthew 23 verse 12. And it's very significant that Jesus mentioned this law of the Spirit three times in His ministry. And uh, when, whenever in the Bible you read a thing three times, it, it, it says something. It's, it's pretty important for you and I to take note of it and to practice it. And the Bible says that whoever exalts himself, Jesus speaking, will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. That is a spiritual law. And if you ignore this law, this law will break you. Just like there are natural laws, and if you uh, ignore the natural laws, those laws will break you. If you are on a ship and you decide that you're going to step out in the ocean and you're going to start walking on the water, you are ignoring a certain law uh, of gravity. And uh, you will sink. <laughs> and maybe a, a shark will come by and, and gobble you up. And so that law will destroy you. Or if you walk out of an airplane in mid-air, you will come down. Or if you walk out a window on the 10th floor, you are ignoring the law of gravity and that law will break you. Okay? Will destroy you. And so there are spiritual laws that govern the universe. And if we ignore those laws, it will break us. Uh, it will cause us not to experience God's best for our lives and one of those laws is uh, pride versus humility uh, this thing that we've just read in Matthew if you exalt yourself you will be abased you will be uh, humiliated or humbled uh, but if you humble yourself and the Bible actually instructs us it says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up and uh, we have Jesus as the perfect example. Jesus who was with God, who was God, was the Word of God. He humbled Himself, laid down His godly attributes, became a servant, became like one of us. And as He was found in the likeness of man, He, he, were, he was obedient even until death. He served and He was absolutely humble. He, uh, and, and we are to follow Him that um, example. Amen? Now we saw this morning that Satan's pride had as its goal to be equal with God. That's what he wanted. He wanted equality with God. He was not content to just be the most beautiful, the most wise uh, cherub. He who exalts himself will be humbled. And Satan reached up and he slipped and he fell and all his angels that he influenced fell with him. A third of the angels fell with him. They were cast out. They were expelled out of heaven. Now instead of being Lucifer the light bringer, he became known as Satan, which is the adversary or enemy of both man and God. Now if you don't know that there's an enemy, a spiritual enemy, then I want to tell you that. I want to make sure that you know that this evening. There is an enemy of your soul. There is an enemy that hates you with a passion that he will do everything in his power to destroy you. And uh, he's out uh, walking like a roaring lion, the Bible says, seeking whom he may devour. And if he can find an entrance into your life, he's going to get in and he's going to destroy it. But the wonderful thing is that if you are in Christ and you've made Jesus your Lord, then the blood of Christ covers you and Jesus protects you. Uh, but that also does not mean that you should uh, just live the way that you want to. You cannot continue to live in sin 
because you will open up doors for the enemy. You will give him a right into your life. Amen? And so the, uh, the seraph named Lucifer became Satan the adversary, the enemy of both God and man. Now let's look at the fall of man. Satan had a special enmity against man for two reasons. I should actually say he still has special en enmity uh, against man for two main reasons. Number one, he could attack God's image in man. He hates God because he wanted to be like God. God threw him out. He hates him. And so he looks at man and you know by now from this morning's sermon that we were created in the image of God. The image of God was imprinted upon humanity, upon Adam. And so when Satan looks at you and me, he sees the Im imprint of God, the image of God. And so uh, he wants to attack that with all of his might. Now man in a special way, visibly, visibly, you and I visibly represent God to the rest of creation. Satan hates that. Satan hates that. Satan could not touch God himself, but he made war against the very image of God in man. Now you know why he hates you. Without reason. He hates you. He destroys. He wants to destroy you. He has got no compassion for you. He's got no ability to love or to feel sorry for you. He wants only to destroy you. And if he uses his people, Satanists and occultists, all of those people, at the end he destroys them. Uh, everyone who works for him, he destroys. There's no, uh, there's no loyalty in him at all. There's no love in him at all. He's absolute darkness. He's gone beyond uh, redemption. There's no redemption for him. There's no forgiveness for him. And so he's absolute evil, absolute darkness. Okay, and so uh, because he could not touch God, he makes war on the image of God in man. And he wants to destroy it and defile it. That's why he defiles people with so much of sin and uh, uh, involvement in the occult and all kinds of things. Uh, and he wants to humiliate the image of God in you. Now man was destined to take Satan's place in dominion. Satan saw in man a rival. Saw in man a rival whom he must and wants to destroy. Because remember before he was in, God, in the garden uh, uh, of God, Eden. Uh, we've read that this morning. And it would seem like he was ruling and reigning from the earth. He had his own sanctuaries from the earth by which or from which he worshipped God, trained the angels in worship. And the Bible says he defiled his sanctuaries because of his sin and because of what he has done. Okay? And now he sees in man this rival. Man took his place because he fell. Now Satan procured man's downfall through the same motivation that caused his own downfall. And this is described, let's quickly read in Genesis 3, verse 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. And he quotes the words of God. God said, You will surely die if you do it. And Satan, through the snake, said, You will not surely die. You will not die, die. You will not die spiritually, and you will not die physically. And he convinced the woman uh, that uh, it was okay. And... Uh, 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 he, he tempted her with the same disobedience and rebellion. She was persuaded by the serpent, took the fruit, and persuaded her husband to join her in disobedience. Now, there's three phases of this temptation. I just want to want to quickly uh, um, highlight. Number one, was there more than just three? Uh, it was directed against God's word. Satan directed his temptation to Eve against God's word. As he left it with Adam and Eve. 
as God said it and left it with Adam and Eve, Satan direct his temptation against that word. And he opposes it and he said, you will not surely die. His first approach was to question God's word. His motive was to discredit God's word. Has God said? He knew what God said. Now he's asking her, has God said? He attacks the word of God. He wants to discredit the word of God. He began with a question. He's so very subtle. When Eve entertained the question, he pro pro proceeded to discredit God himself. And then he said in verse 4 to 5, he says, you will not surely die. So he discredited God. The implication was that God was a tyrant keeping them in a lower state than what they deserved. That they had potential in them an ability to become something much higher. Higher beings. But that God kept them in unreasonable subjection. That was the, that was the implication of what He was saying to them. He was basically saying God is lying to you. If you take off this fruit, you will be like God in knowing good and evil. But now God doesn't want you to know good and evil. God wants to keep certain knowledge away from you so that He can keep you in slavery subject to, to God. Look how clever He is. Now after discrediting God's word, He proceeded to discredit God's character. He wanted to give them a false picture of God, God who is love, and He presented Him as an arbitrary despot. That's what, he's, what, what He was doing. He was, he was saying that God is actually this tyrant, this despot that doesn't want you to have the best, that wants to keep you as slaves. And, and they did not realize, they did not for one moment think of the fact that they were created in the image of God. They had everything that God could possibly give them. God made them rulers over all of His work. Amen? And here they get caught up with the lie of the devil telling them a story, misrepresenting God, assassinating the character of God. Now you can think of this, what's happening here, and you can apply it in many areas in your life. People who are doing exactly the same thing. At church, at work, and families, doing exactly the same thing. Satan using them to do this. Now, having discredited God's word and character, he wanted to give them a false picture of the loving and gracious God. And then he offered them the very same motivation that caused his own fall. And what was that? You'll find out. He basically said to them, you will be like God when your eyes are opened. Then you will notice that you are like God. With other words, you would not need to depend on God alone any longer. You will now be self-sufficient. And you can now depend on yourself. That is pride. Okay? He stirs that up in their hearts. You'll have enough knowledge in yourself that you will be equal with God. The same words that he used in Isaiah, I will be like God. He speaks to them saying, you will be like God. And even today, there are much teaching going around that says you and I can be like God. We are like God. We are in the image of God, but we are not God. With other words, he says, this place of subjection that you are finding yourself in right now is not worthy of you. Reach out for knowledge. Reach out for knowledge that will set you free from the slavish dependence on God. Isn't that so? People want knowledge, always seeking for knowledge. Gain knowledge so that they can ascend into a higher state of being. And that's the temptation of Satan. So that you can become something bigger, better, higher. Maybe better than God. There are religions that actually believe that through a process of evolving you become a God. And that's 
the temptation that Satan has always used with humanity. Now there's seven results of Adam's fall. Quickly. Adam's direct fellowship with God was broken. Listen, this is what pride does. The Bible says God keeps the prideful afar uh, off. God hates the prideful. God hates the haughty. Haughty is when you look down on people and He keeps you far off. God does not associate with the pride. God hates it. Because Satan fell because of the fact that he became prideful. But He gives grace to the humble, the Bible says. So when Adam fell, his direct fellowship with God was broken. Remember we said this morning that God created man to have fellowship with Him. Person to person, one on one. And now this was broken because of pride and sin. Adam's life source was cut off. God is our life source. God gives us life. God gives us eternal life. The moment He breathed into man, into that molded clay, he, uh, I explained to you this morning, it was with such force that it breathed in that it was a continuous thing that happened. With other words, if you, if you would think of man uh, as uh, someone that had a battery that had to be charged with this breath of God, God charged him and that charge, that one single charge, that breathing in to him kept him alive for hundreds of years. They lived hundreds of years. But now he was cut off from that life source. So the battery ran out, so to speak. And he eventually died. Okay? Just a way of looking at it, to make it understandable. His life source was cut off. He could not be recharged. His initial breath that he received from God could keep him alive. Like I said, for several hundred years, which happened. They lived up almost, some of them, up until a thousand years. Ultimately, he had to die in the flesh as well. Now, Adam became subject. This is another result of his fall. He became subject to corruption. Now, if something is corrupt or being corrupted, you can never reverse it. You can take an apple, you can take a bite out of an apple or a pear, uh, and you can put it there in the sun. What will happen to it? It will begin to turn black eventually. And you cannot reverse that process. It doesn't matter what you do it. You can even inject uh, what else into it. <laughs> it will not. Maybe if you... In no, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah. Praise the year. Uh, so Adam came subject to corruption, which is, in a human body, what is corruption? Sickness. Old age, death, wrinkles, pain, diseases. By the way, if you haven't read my, my, my uh, message to you on the bulk, uh, um, what, what do you call it? On the, bulk, the, the group for, for, for the bulk uh, um, storage. storage. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmetics are going to become very expensive. So, um, if you have extra money at the end of the month, after you've paid your dues to God, then spend it on cosmetics. Margarine is another one. And uh, what's the other one? Oil. Uh, oil has already become expensive. But now, for now, it's margarine, cosmetics, and... Shampoo. 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 And the other day I was thinking about shampoo. I thought to say to her, listen, let us... Let us buy in bulk shampoo because I've just got this feeling. And it seems like it was the right <laughs> feeling. Uh, okay. So Adam became subject to corruption, sickness, old age, death, wrinkles, pain, diseases. Adam became subject to satanic harassment, to the activity of demons. Up to the time he lived, up to that time he lived in a world that had no satanic powers because they could not penetrate his world because he was under perfect protection of God. The glory, the presence of God clothed him and protected him. But now from that time, from the time that he fell forward, the whole human race was subject to harassment 
of satanic demonic influences. And that's why from the days of old, from Jesus' ministry right up until today, we have to deal with demons in people. We have to cast them out and set people free because many demons cause sickness and disease in people. And they are destructive. They lead people astray. They destroy. Uh, there's no, nothing good about them. They are evil. They are doing the bidding of Satan. Now Adam became subject to satanic harassment after he fell. Adam became a slave instead of a king. Remember God wanted him to be king, to be ruler. Now he became a slave. A slave to Satan. A slave to sin. A slave to death. A slave to corruption. He had been created to rule, but that's not what happened. Now his rulership, he has given over to Satan. And Satan, the Bible says, has become the God of this world. Of this world system. Now he was to rule, Adam was to rule on God's behalf on the whole earth. But when he lost his position of dependence on God. Remember I said this morning, we must be dependent on God. We cannot be dependent on ourselves. You cannot depend on another man. You cannot depend on your job or your company. You must have total dependence in God. And when he lost that, when he no longer were dependent upon God, he could no longer rule. But he became a slave to sin and to Satan, to corruption, to sickness, to death. And that's the reason why people die and become sick. Because of that first initial sin of Adam and Eve. Because they were lifted up in pride. Lifting themselves up above the knowledge of God that said you must not. And they listened to Satan. And they wanted to be exactly what Satan wanted to be. They wanted to be equal with God. Because Satan tempted them with that. Adam's whole realm became subject to vanity or futility. That's number six. There was a change in the whole realm of creation that Adam was set over to rule. Adam's fall affected all that were under him. Everything. The whole of creation, the animal kingdom, uh, the vegetation, everything became corrupt because of his fall. Things that never used to rot started to rot. Things that never died started to die. Things that never suffered began uh, to decay and to die. The animal creation, the vegetable creation, everything all around. The whole of creation was affected. Now you can understand that scripture that says all of creation is in the Afrikaans say Barens Via. Totdat die seens van God geopenbaar word. The whole of creation is in birth pangs, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God to be delivered from this corruption. That's why you see so many earthquakes and things, natural disasters happening. The whole of creation is crying out for deliverance. And it's going to be soon. Adam became identified to Satan, number seven. He became identified to Satan in the guilt of rebellion. Satan had made a convert. Before that, he had long been the rebel. The lone rebel with his third of angels. But now there was another rebel band to join him. And that was the Adamic race. Adam repeated Satan's error. Adam was created on a certain level. But through pride, he reached up again, just like Satan, to equality with God. And in reaching up, he fell. In exalting himself, he fell. In exalting himself, that spiritual law that governs the universe broke him. And he was cast down. He was removed from the Garden of Eden. And untold... Hardships faced him from that day on forward. Remember this. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And we're going to continue with this 
maybe one or two services. And uh, I want you, my goal with this, with this teaching is to get all of us to realize that we have a responsibility to humble ourselves before God. Humbling yourself is your responsibility. It's not God's responsibility. The Bible says if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, He will lift us up. He will cause us to attain to the destiny that He has planned for us from before the foundation of the world. You will never enter the ministry that God has for you until you humble yourself. You will never be used of God mightily in the power of the Holy Spirit unless you humble yourself before God and become totally dependent on Him. You will never be able to survive the storms that are coming upon the world unless you humble yourself and depend on Him. But you know what? The Bible says if you have humbled yourself under God, you can resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil is afraid of the Christian that humbles him or herself under the mighty hand of God. And so let us do that. There's many ways of humbling yourself. We did it yesterday. Fasting is a way of humbling ourselves. And then you see things happen that you've been praying for long uh, days and uh, never seen the fulfillment of it. And all of a sudden there's the breakthrough because you humble yourself before God. Uh, and, and we should, serving is humbling yourself, serving one another, looking for opportunity to bless one another, making yourself less, thinking of yourself less than other people. With other words, thinking other people, uh, of other people as more than you. The, uh, Jesus even uh, gives examples. He says, when you are uh, invited to a feast, take the lowest seat. Humble yourself. Take the lowest seat. Because then there's room for you to go up. But if you are taking the highest, the chief, the most important seats, chances are that someone might tell you to go down the line because someone more important than you has arrived. So in many ways, we must become conscious of the fact that we need to be humble. Now, being humble is not having an attitude of exquisite liavani. Humility is just humbling yourself, taking the lowest place, being uh, available to serve, um, obeying God, telling God you depend on Him, showing it to Him in a practical way by fasting. You know when you fast, you become hungry, you become thirsty, and all of a sudden you begin to realize that if it was not for God, I would not have food and I would not have drink. But if you lift yourself up and say, well, I'll make a way for me. I'll drill a borehole. I will, I will, I will, I will. Uh, uh, you'll find that all of those things will run out. You'll find that your company will close. What then? There's no income. What then? Who are you going to trust then? But if we put our trust in God, we are humble before Him. We are not confident in ourselves. Amen? And that's where tithes and offerings also come from. It is because... As we give, we say to God, I trust you. You require this for me to return the tithes. I'm doing it in obedience to you as an act of worship, but also in this act of worship, I humble myself. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm dependent on you. You are the one who gives me strength to obtain wealth. It's not my strength. It's not my ability. Although I may be talented and blessed in all kinds of areas, it is still God that gives it to me. Still God that made me that way. Still God. And so we must always acknowledge God in all things. The Bible says, acknowledge Him in all of your ways and He will make straight your paths. So let's walk in humbleness. Amen. When you love one another, there's another thing. Praying for one another. Prayer is a way of humbling yourself and of serving. Okay, especially when you have to pray for your enemies. You feel like you don't want to. And you kneel and you pray for them. You are humbling yourself before God. And He will lift you up. Amen. Praise the year. Let's close our eyes. Father, we thank You for this word tonight. We pray that You will bless it. 
uh, and everyone that is listening on the, the internet, Father, bless them. And I want to encourage you to go and uh, listen to all of this, uh, these messages in the series and uh, really come before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be humble. Don't ask God to humble you. That's an unscriptural prayer. Uh, you don't want God to humble you. God says you must humble yourself. And if you don't humble yourself, you'll find that God will find a way of humiliating you. <laughs> you don't want that. Rather choose to humble yourself before God. Now while every eye is closed, I just want to give this invitation. If you have never really given your heart to the Lord Jesus, you're not born again, all of this is strange to you, you don't know if you die tonight that you will be with Jesus, that you have eternal life, or if you've backslidden and you uh, feel that you just want to make sure that you're right with God, I want to give you this opportunity to just lift up your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray with you. Is there anybody like that? Are you all saved? Receive Jesus? Amen. You're all saved. Amen. Praise God. And Father, now we pray in the name of Jesus that you will strengthen each one. I pray, Lord, that the power of God will come upon each one sitting here in this place and each one listening via the internet. Lord, that uh, you will give them the assurance of salvation. That they will understand that it's not necessary to again and again and again give their hearts to the Lord. It's a thing that we do once with a sincerity and with all of our hearts. And from there on we believe it and live it. And uh, we speak it forth. In the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you lead them through the baptismal waters and that you fill them with your Holy Spirit. I pray now, Lord, that you will also deliver them and heal them because Christ, you paid for all of that in Jesus' name. Well, bless the Lord. I want to encourage you to keep on coming to both services. It's important that we as Christians, now as we see the coming of the Lord draws near, to come together often. That's what Hebrews says. And that's the thing that most Christians uh, do not adhere to. They try or they give all kinds of excuses not to come together. There's something special when we get, get together. It's totally different than watching a sermon online or on television. There's a presence and an anointing of God for those who come together. And, and, and Jesus specifically said, or the, the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, Do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together, especially when you see the day of the Lord draws near. Amen. Now, the apostles of old, the disciples, were together in one place, in the upper room. When the Holy Spirit came. And who knows. What God will do at any given time. And if you are not there. You must think of Thomas. Doubting Thomas. When the Lord Jesus first appeared to the disciples. He was not there. And when they told him that. He didn't believe it. So don't miss out. On what God wants to do. God can just suddenly come and visit us. In great power. And I'm expecting that to happen. I'm expecting a visitation from God to this little church. And God's going to use us tremendously. Amen. Amen. So come on Sunday mornings. Come on Sunday evenings. Come on Wednesday evenings. And participate. Amen. If you've got petrol problems, make it known. And see how we can help you. If, you. if you really want to serve God, come. Now I know there's some of you that you are newly born again. And you need to come... Uh, to, 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 to go through uh, a teaching, basic doctrines that we would like to do with you. And so we will be in contact and, and see how we can arrange that because that's part of making disciples, teaching uh, you so that you can be rooted and grounded in the truth that you can begin to understand what it's all about and what Jesus has done and what He has freely given you and how you can live victorious in this life. All right? And so... Uh, Expect us to, to call you at some time and uh, we'll pick a day, maybe a Saturday, uh, that works best. And we'll spend the whole day and give you lunch even and uh, teach you the Word of God. Amen.
I know some of the home churches are already doing it in their home church, so that you carry on with that and you finish with that. But for the, for the rest, we will we will make a special arrangement. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lift up your hands and just receive God's blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and I pray that you will now, Lord, cause your face to shine upon these dear people of God. I pray, Lord, that you will bless them and that you will give them peace. I pray, Lord, that you will lead them in ways, your ways of righteousness and holiness all the days of their lives. Pray that you will give your angels charge over them to keep them in all their ways. I pray, Lord, that you open doors for them of income, of prosperity, that you prosper them uh, uh, even as their soul prospers. I pray, Lord, that you give them great desire to seek after your face in daily reading of the word, daily prayer, coming to church, and uh, even through fasting, that they will seek the face of God so that they can experience in this life the blessing of God. For Lord, we're not only hoping for eternity with you to be blessed, but Lord, we trust you that we shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living right now, even in the midst of storms. And as the world, world gets darker, I thank you that we will shine brighter as your children. In the name of Jesus, use each one here. Lord, let not one be lost, I pray. But Father, work in our hearts continuously to will and to do your good pleasure. And I just bless them in the name of Jesus the Christ. And everybody said, Amen, amen and Amen. God bless you.